Good morning, everybody. Welcome to PCH Grand Rounds. Happy Tuesday morning. Very nice to see everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning Dr. Jonathan German. Dr. German is a native of Phoenix. He's a Sun Devil. He majored in English Linguistics at ASU. He then went on to complete medical school at the University of Utah. Then went on to his residency in anesthesia in Gainesville, Florida. And then a fellowship in pediatric anesthesia at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He's been here at PCH with Valley Anesthesia, Anesthesiology since 2012. And he's the medical director of the pain medicine program and the chief of the pain section. Please welcome Dr. German. Good morning. Um, so just as a little caveat, a couple weeks ago I was um, on trauma anesthesia and I went down and responded to a trauma and Dan Ostley happened to be the trauma surgeon on call. And as the trauma was unfolding and the patient was being taken care of, Dan grabbed me and pulled me into the corner of the room and said, hey, do you mind doing grand rounds in a couple of weeks? Um, and he's, he's not even here to, uh, to be part of this. So I, I'm sure he's watching this on Zoom. All right, so I, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about multimodal pain management, and hopefully this won't be too painful. Okay, you're awake, all right. Um, unfortunately, I have no disclosures this morning. Um, so this is the outline. Basically, I want to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of pain, which is important for us to understand. A quick slide about the opioid epidemic, which is very important, not necessarily because of the headlines, but um, because of what's happened over the many years, and I think how treatment of pain contributes to that. Then we'll talk a little bit about the mechanism of pain, um, and then jump into the actual topic of the talk, which is multimodal pain management, and then discuss what I believe the future holds for multimodal analgesia. So uh, pain is the number one leading cause for an individual to actually seek medical attention. Um, responsible for about 80% of visits. That's more than cancer, heart disease, and uh, diabetes combined, costing this nation over $600 billion a year. Kids are not immune to this. And in fact, between 50 and 80% of kids will experience some sort of acute pain in their life. Between 25 and 40% of kids will experience chronic pain. And chronic pain is defined as pain that lasts between three to six months and greater. So um, pretty significant disease. Eight percent of all children will experience debilitating pain. And debilitating pain, yeah. So that's between the 50 and 80 percent, yeah. Right. Um, so eight percent of kids experiencing debilitating pain. Debilitating pain is pain that actually prevents or precludes these patients from participating in their social environment or their sleep disturbances, or they have family issues, missing school, if they're older, missing work, et cetera. So, um, which is pretty astounding, considering the fact that here in Metropolitan Phoenix, the population is about four and a half million people. About a quarter of those are people under the age of 18. So just about 1.2 million kids in Metropolitan Phoenix, 8% is roughly almost 100,000 kids that experience debilitating pain just here in Metropolitan Phoenix. Okay, so the opioid epidemic. I wanted to just do a quick slide on this, mostly because I think, you know, the epidemic has ensued over many, many years, and we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, recently, obviously, because of the headlines, it's, be, it's kind of more under the spotlight. A lot of it, or part of it, I think is actually due to mismanagement of pain or mistreatment of pain over a long period of time. And so I wanted to just kind of throw some numbers out there just to kind of um, reiterate or, or shed light on the importance and the magnitude of this epidemic. So in 2015, over 50,000 people were killed from drug overdoses. Almost half of those were from prescription opioids. Kids are also not immune to this. In that same year, almost a quarter of a million adolescents admitted to being non-medical users of pain relievers, with over 120,000 of them addicted to prescription pain medicine. And this is important because um, there's a direct or independently associated um, component with patients receiving prescribed opioids before their 12th year in school, or so their senior year in high school, uh, and future misuse of opioids. 
Between 1994 and 2007, the amount of opioid prescriptions that we as prescribers were writing doubled over that time period. All right, so the mechanism of pain. This is important to understand because with multimodal pain management, we actually target different levels of the pain pathway to treat patients in pain. So there are what I like to say four different um, intersections along the pain pathway. The first one is transduction, which is where the initial injury occurs, causing local inflammation from inflammatory cytokines. Those cytokines cause ionic transfers, leading to an action potential that then uh, transmits a message through the nociceptor up to the spinal cord of the dorsal root ganglion and then um, carry the message up to the brain where a very important process called perception occurs. Perception really is interpretation of that message in context of whatever setting that individual may be in. And then a very important process called modulation occurs at that point where off cells and on cells are able to inhibit or promote signals going up and down to kind of gauge an appropriate response to the pain. So just to kind of show you an example of this, um, my boys were, were part of a skateboard club this last year, and my 12-year-old son um, was skateboarding, and he came home with a, a gash in his forehead. And so basically this is kind of the conversation that happened. Came home, had this uh, paper towel over his forehead, and I said, Nate, what happened? He said, Dad, it was awesome. <laughs> it doesn't even hurt, but you should have seen me. I gapped this five foot, it was probably two feet, five foot gap, and in midair, I did a 360 on the skateboard, landed, but when I landed, the skateboard bounced up and hit me in the forehead. Immediately, my coach applied paper towels and called mom and brought me home. I said, that sounds really cool, Dad. It was sick, he said. So I said, okay, speaking of sick, why don't you show me what it looks like? So we took off the paper towels. My wife is standing next to me, and immediately her face goes, oh, my gosh, that's huge. So what was Nathan's response? All of a sudden, he went from no pain to all of a sudden, well, what's going on? How, how big is it? is it? Is it bleeding? Dad, this is really starting to hurt. This is, oh, I, oh my gosh, I don't understand it. Why is it hurting so much now? Can I take a look at it? I said, no, you can't see it. What does my wife do? Pulls out her phone, turns it on selfie mode, and lets him see his face. All of a sudden, the pain escalates, right? <laughs> So, and he starts to actually cry. This isn't the actual picture because the betadine wasn't there yet, but he starts to cry. So what happened? Did the pain stimulus change? Did it increase? It didn't increase at all. In fact, the perception of the message changed and the modulation also changed. Okay, so it's important for us to understand that pain isn't just about the tissues, it's an output of the brain, all right? Okay, so um, acute pain. Acute pain is pain that lasts less than three to six months. It oftentimes serves as a warning or even a protection to our bodies. So if I were to put my hand on a hot stove, immediately my body will withdraw my hand, thus protecting me from further injury and warning me that there's a danger there. Okay, so acute pain naturally serves as a warning and protection to our bodies. It has, if left in the injurious um, environment, potentially detrimental physiologic responses. And these include um, high heart rate, high blood pressure, venous stasis, decreased ventilation, high blood, high blood sugar, immunosuppression, cognitive dysfunction, which is more relevant in the older population, um, not necessarily in, in children. All of this leads to increased morbidity. It also triggers a very important event, which is centrally mediated pain hypersensitivity which we believe then can lead on to chronic pain or development of chronic pain. So the mechanism of chronic pain is much different, obviously, than acute pain. The mechanism of chronic pain no longer involves a protection um, to the body. And it's this process known as sensitization. And it occurs centrally. It also occurs peripherally. So central sensitization um, is basically hyperexcitability of, of neurons in the spinal cord and also in the brainstem after an injury or some sort of inflammation. Peripheral sensitization is a little bit different because obviously it involves the periphery, and this is hyperexcitability of peripheral nociceptors 
that lead to altered response to subsequent stimuli, um, promoting therefore nerve growth factor, which then promotes growth of cells into abnormal regions such as A beta touch fibers going into nociceptor territory. I think the most, the easiest illustration of this concept occurs in patients with complex regional pain syndrome. So most of us have seen children with complex regional pain syndrome, but even before the trophic changes occur, which involves changing of the skin coloration, the hair growth, the nails, et cetera, they will have what we call allodynia, um, or develop allodynia and hyperalgesia, where in a normal non-painful stimulus, such as rubbing your hand on your skin, which is not supposed to hurt, will actually cause a very, very painful burning um, sensation in these patients to the point of tears, um, even a physiologic response, tachycardia, hypertension, et cetera. So um, this concept of sensitization is very, very real and um, very difficult to treat. This, these are um, histological slides of a newborn uh, mouse after skin wounding a few days after birth where uh, repetitive skin wounding occurred on one paw. You can see the abnormal nerve growth up here up into the nociceptor region. And this is the contralateral normal side where the stains uh, do not show that abnormal nerve growth. So this leads to a concept called plasticity. And plasticity can occur um, in the brain involving the sensory cortex, the frontal lobe, and also the periphery. All of this leads to perception of constant pain and altered inhibition uh, mechanisms. There's this um, clinical neuro... Um, scientist in Australia who speaks a lot about pain, treats a lot of patients in, with chronic pain. And this is a quote that I really like by him. Pain isn't just about the tissues of the body, it's an output of the brain, which I mentioned earlier. And he goes on to talk about how um, it's important when treating patients with chronic pain especially, but also acute pain, to understand the psychology behind the pain. All right, so why do we not treat opioid or chronic pain with opioids? This is very important and, and um, you know as a pain service here sometimes we get a bad rap or um, misunderstanding because oftentimes if we get consulted on chronic pain patients we will recommend weaning very rapidly off of the opioids and I just want to talk about why it's important not to treat patients in chronic pain with opioids from a, a uh, biologic standpoint so we've all heard of this concept opioid induced hyperalgesia in and of itself Chronic stimulation of mu receptors with narcotics leads to alteration of the pain pathways, which ultimately leads to increased pain. So um, breaking it down, we just discussed sensitization. Central sensitization leads to um, decreased mu receptor expression. So if I give patients who already have decreased mu receptor expression opioids and ex try to stimulate those receptors even more, um, I get decreased effectiveness and I get increased pain. So if I'm, a, if I'm a provider, if I'm a prescriber that doesn't understand this concept so well, and I have a patient come to me with chronic pain, and I've tried all of the non-opioid medications possible and therapies, and the patient continues to have pain, I'm therefore going to write a, a prescription for a narcotic. A month later, the patient's going to come back to me and say, you know what, doc, this narcotic doesn't work. And in fact, the duration of the benefit has gone from two hours now down to 30 minutes. But I'm still getting some benefit, doc, 30 minutes. What should we do? Well, not understanding this concept, I may actually prescribe a higher dose at that point. And one thing might lead to another, and all of a sudden I've got my patient on long-acting oxycodone with PRN oxycodone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and before I know it, they're on methadone and seeing a chronic pain doctor. So what happened? If I continue to prescribe these um, mu agonists in this setting, um, the, the medications will actually release peptides, and cholecystokinin is probably the most common one. There are other ones, uh, neuropeptide FF, that also gets released that will further inhibit the mu receptors, causing even worse pain control. So um, very important concept to, to understand, and I'm, I'm talking a lot about this because this leads up to why multimodal pain management actually came about and how we should use it with our patients today. All right, so on to the final topic here. Um, multimodal pain management was introduced back in the early 90s by someone smart 
who uh, noticed that a lot of the surgical patients were taking a long time to wake up, they were staying in the recovery area, they were nauseous, uh, their pain wasn't always well controlled, up on the floor, they were constipated, they weren't eating, they weren't wanting to get out of bed and participate with physical therapy. And so someone said something's got to change. A lot of this has to do with what we believe to be the side effects of the opioids that these patients are getting. So how about we try giving them non-opioid pain medicines to see if we can actually improve the outcomes. And so they started to do that and all of a sudden patients were waking up after anesthesia. They were um, mobilizing, they were getting out of the recovery area faster and out of the hospital faster. And so not only did the physicians and patients like this, but the hospitals also really liked this because it saved them money. And so this eventually expanded to include all patients, not just operative patients. And so basically, um, this is a model of what multimodal pain management looks like. It's, a, it's an opioid sparing concept. So we try to minimize opioids. And I'm not trying to say that opioids are not indicated ever in patients in acute pain, because they are many times, especially post-surgical pain in some trauma patients. So it's, it's opioid sparing, that being said. So we utilize non-pharmacological techniques. We use other adjuvants, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Um, acetaminophen is a big adjuvant, and then regional anesthesia as well. There are three main goals that I like to think of with multimodal pain management, and that is optimizing pain management, minimizing the side effects of the medications that we give, and then also preventing progression or development of chronic pain. So um, in support, and I really should give credit to the ofermev.com website for this list, but there are many organizations that support this concept of multimodal pain management. Um, and these are just a few of those organizations. All right, so we, um, like I said, along the pain pathway is where we target different modalities or treatments to actually treat pain, um, rather than focusing on one area at one time. The benefits of multimodal pain management include improved perioperative outcomes, patients get up quicker, um, and earlier, pain relief is actually better. We're able to spare a lot of the opioids and therefore the side effects of the opioids. Um, they're able to eat earlier. There's earlier PACU, hospital discharge, which means um, money saving for the hospital. And then one of the things I like the best is preemptive analgesia. So pre the idea of preemptive analgesia is that we can actually prevent a pain signal from occurring before it even occurs. And a lot of the studies of preemptive analgesia occurred with um, neuraxial anesthesia, or epidurals, or spinals. And so these, were, these studies were done in patients who were going to have a, an amputation of an extremity. And so they had an epidural placed pre-incision. Um, those who had the epidural and were amputated had a much less likelihood of developing phantom limb pain afterwards, significantly less likelihood compared to those who never received an epidural. So there's a lot of data to suggest that if we're able to prevent the pain signal from occurring before the pain signal even occurs, then um, we can prevent the cascade of the harmful, harmful uh, effects of pain, one of which is development of chronic pain. Okay, so um, the American Pain Society put together a task force um, for regional and neuraxial anesthesia just to look at the um, literature and to decide the, uh, from a, a um, research standpoint and best practice standpoint, what recommendations they would come up with. And so basically from a, a peripheral, this is the peripheral side, peripheral anesthesia, regional anesthesia, and the neuraxial anesthesia. Basically in adults and children, um, they strongly recommend, or at least moderately um, recommend, the use of single injection and continuous injection regional anesthesia in patients where indicated and where it might be benefited with high quality and moderate quality evidence in all of those cases. All right, so the benefits of regional anesthesia. So decreased hormonal stress response, very, very important um, because this leads to sympathetic responses of pain. Site-specific analgesia, we're able to actually select um, large regions or even small regions of the body to completely anesthetize and to prevent the pain response in that area. Opioid sparing, even if we do use neuraxial anesthesia, 
um, the amount of opioids that we put in those are actually less than what would be required orally or IV in these patients. So in and of itself, even if used uh, opioids with these techniques, they're opioid sparing. Um, earlier recover of bowel function, this was, the data for this was mostly in patients um, with large abdominal surgeries and a thoracic epidural placed. There's uh, much less potential for general anesthesia when we use these techniques intraoperatively, and then again with the hospitals like decreased ho oops, hospital stay and decreased PACU stay. All right, so we use local anesthetics, and as you know, local anesthetics are sodium channel blockers, which prevent the influx of the sodium, which then eventually propagates an action potential and carries this, the pain signal up to the brain. Um, so local anesthetics prevent that from happening. We use short-acting lidocaine, and we also use longer-acting bupivacaine and ropivacaine in this institution. There are very long-acting local anesthetics, um, which many of you already know about. Liposomal bupivacaine is one of those that's on the market. This um, concoction releases over time bupivacaine from these multivesicular liposomes, resulting in kind of a steady state of bupivacaine at the deposited uh, location in the body getting upwards of 72 hours or sometimes even longer duration of um, the effect of the medication. At this time, unfortunately, that medication is only approved for adults, but um, hopefully in the future we'll be seeing some of that available for children. Um, there are other options that are not on the market but coming out on the market. Dr. Birdie out of Boston Children's has been working on a toxin from an algae in Chile this um, toxin now purified, he calls neosaxotoxin, which is a site one sodium channel blocker. And he's been able to get duration anywhere between 24 and 48 hours at this time and, and thinks he can actually make it last longer. The big benefit of this medication compared to other medications are the um, proclaimed decreased cardiac and neurotoxicity side effects from the local anesthetics. Interesting study they did in Chile with patients undergoing a cholecystectomy where they injected the port sites with bupivacaine in one cohort and neosaxitoxin in the other cohort. And at 12 hours post-op, the neosaxitoxin cohort reported uh, much better pain scores and, um, and 24 hours as well and less opioid usage and then also reported a two-day earlier recovery to function compared to the bupivacaine cohort. So we hope to see more um, trials with these medications and hopefully will come down the pike to us um, in the world of children. All right, non-opioid medications. And I have to say, most of these medications are off-label use for um, treating pain in, in children. Um, but there are many non-opioid medications that we utilize in these patients. Acetaminophen, very common. We use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs anticonvulsants, gabapentin and pregabulin are the ones um, we utilize, alpha-2 agonists, antidepressants, and then NMDA receptor antagonists. And I'll talk a little bit about these um, individually. All right, so acetaminophen comes in three forms. It can be administered orally, IV, and per rectum, as you know. Um, the analgesic mechanism is relatively unknown, or at least no one really wants to own up to the theorized mechanism, but the um, theory is that it, its analgesic properties occur through its uh, ability to prevent prostaglandin synthesis. Its antipyretic mechanism occurs in the hypothalamus. It's very similar to Ketorolac from an analgesic standpoint, so it's a very good non-opioid analgesic to use in patients. Um, the big question always is IV versus oral. Which one do we use? And, and, you know, cost always comes up, and just last week we were talking to the um, IV acetaminophen rep, and from what I understand, the vials are now being sold to the hospital for around $25. I don't know what the patients are being charged, but um, the vial to the hospital is not super expensive. That being said, what are the benefits and what are the cons? Um, IV obviously has quicker onset, 15 minutes, as opposed to about 45 minutes to an hour for oral acetaminophen. Um, the studies show that IV and oral are likely equal analges analgesic and no real differences in safety as well. So when do we recommend using IV acetaminophen? If patients are under general anesthesia and they don't have an OG tube in and you're not too excited to crush an acetaminophen tablet, 
then IV acetaminophen is probably pretty appropriate. There, um, there is evidence of high preemptive analgesic effect with IC, IV acetaminophen. Interesting study where they took randomized patients into two groups. One group got IV acetaminophen pre-incision, so before the incision was made in surgery, and then post-incision. And those who received it pre-incision had much better pain scores, significantly better, and significantly less use of opioids uh, post-operatively. So if you um, do want to use IV acetaminophen, it, it has much greater benefit pre-incision. And then um, after surgery, obviously those who are NPO or with G absorption difficulties, IV acetaminophen is, is beneficial. Non-steroidals, uh, the commonly used ones here, ibuprofen, ketorolac, and naproxen. Um, mechanism of NSAIDs includes antipyretic as well as analgesic and anti-inflammatory. They act through the cyclooxygenase pathway, leading to inhibition of prostaglandins and thromboxane. Um, so obviously we need to be careful with patients who have gastric problems or underlying kidney problems. Um, most of these NSAIDs provide moderate pain relief. Ketorolac has been shown to provide even superior pain relief than these other uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Anticonvulsants, so gabapentin and pregabalin. So these modulate the release of neurotransmitters, mostly glutamate, and can block the um, transmission of the pain signal. They also have an added benefit by activating noradrenergic pain inhibiting pathways, um, which they believe, some studies believe, can actually prevent the transmission in cent of central sensitization in patients. Post-op pain scores are improved with these patients, um, as well as decreased opioid consumption in patients who receive this medication uh, preoperatively. So the question really is, who do we give these to? and when do we give them? So there's been a lot of studies um, on who benefits from gabapentin. Surgical patients, patients undergoing large surgeries um, benefit from gabapentin. Trauma patients, uh, patients who are receiving a thoracotomy uh, or have nerve injury will uh, benefit from gabapentin or pregabalin. And then patients with high opioid consumption and or who have chronic pain benefit from these medications as, all, as well. So when do we give them? There's been a lot of studies that have looked at the ideal timing of preoperative gabapentin. Some have done it right before incision in the pre-op area, before the patient goes back. Some have done it after incision through an OG tube. Um, and there really was no benefit, significant benefit, between those two cohorts in terms of pain scores and opioid consumption. Both of them dropped opioid consumption and dropped pain scores, but there was no real difference. There was another interesting study that said, well, no duh, because the peak plasma concentration of gabapentin doesn't occur until about two hours. So why don't we give patients gabapentin at least two hours before the incision? So there was one study that did that. Um, wasn't the best modeled study, but they actually showed that patients who received gabapentin two hours or more before uh, incision actually did do better than those who received it afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so my two cents really is, if you can get gabapentin in patients pre-surgery, Great. If not, don't sweat it, because after surgery is still going to benefit them. Alpha-2 agonists, clonidine, dexmedetomidine, and tizanidine are the three that we use here. Clonidine and dexmedetomidine can be given IV, um, orally, intranasally. Clonidine comes in a transdermal um, uh, form as well. Their analgesic effect occurs at the dorsal horn, and um, they also enhance analgesic effects of traditional analgesics. Tizanidine we use as a muscle relaxant. I don't know if you all knew that it was also an alpha agonist, but um, its antispasmodic properties occur by its ability to um, basically inhibit presynaptic uh, motor neurons. And then finally, NMDA antagonists. So NMDA um, receptors are glutamic receptors, and when activated, can induce hyperalgesia. So by blocking these receptors, we can prevent the hyperalgesia. Um, many studies have shown, and ketamine's been around for 100 years. It's been around for a very long time, as you all know, and there's many benefits to ketamine, but it's shown to decrease post-op nausea, vomiting, decrease pain, and obviously decrease opioid consumption. Now, you have to remember two horrible side effects of ketamine, and one is hypersalivation, and the other one is horrible hallucinations. So if you do use ketamine, please pre-treat with midazolam and, and glycopyrrolate. 
Alternative therapies are very, very important. So psychology, I think, is one of the most um, underrated modalities that we have available to treat pain, both acute pain and chronic pain. In fact, a lot of the studies on psychology happens to be in chronic pain, and um, a lot of the randomized control studies show that psychology in and of itself can reduce a chronic pain patient's pain by greater than 50% by itself. So I think we underestimate the power of psychology and therefore the power of the mind in, in controlling pain. Physical therapy, um, also very, very important as we all know. Acupuncture, massage, yoga, and other supplements are just some non-pharmacological uh, modalities that we can implement in patients who have acute pain and chronic pain and minimize the need for opioids and other medications. All right, so pharmacogenetics. So imagine a population of patients with the same diagnosis. And we all have these patients, right? And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be ADHD, it could be depression, hypertension, epilepsy, uh, or pain, for that matter. So this population with the same diagnosis, how do we treat these patients? Oftentimes, we treat them with the same medications or the same approach, right? Or at least we have an algorithm that we will follow. And it's the same thing for a lot of patients. <clears throat> The pharmacogenetics tests are interesting because it brings treatment down to an individual level, which is very important. It looks at the influence, at the allelic differences of a single gene and its interaction with a medication. So how does the medication interact with this patient's gene, essentially? And um, the idea is that we would then be able to even personalize different plans. And it doesn't have to be analgesic, like I said. It, these are different populations. Um, but because I am talking about pain, I'm going to focus on pain here. Um, but we'll optimize pain management, we'll minimize side effects, and prevent chronic pain from developing in a lot of these patients. So what do these tests look like? So this, um, <clears throat> I apologize for how small this is, but you, you can't even see the color actually. This is horrible. Um, I hope you have some slides in front of you. Anyway, let me explain. So. Um, these tests are very robust, very detailed. This is one, actually two pages of about a 55-page report <clears throat> from one patient to uh, a 15-year-old child with um, cerebral palsy, developmental delay, was nonverbal, um, had horrible gastroesophageal reflux disease, was on a slew of medications who came in um, for, I believe it was bilateral lower extremity um, orthopedic procedure involving tendon lengthening, um, tibial rotation, et cetera. Intraoperatively, this child received an, an epidural catheter and, um, and then some obviously other medications, acetaminophen, catorolac, um, some opioids, and uh, went to the recovery area and then up to the floor and actually did very, very well. On post-op day two, was doing well, was tolerating um, feeds and, and getting oral pain medications and had been on IV catorolac for the 72 hours that we allow at this institution. So the epidural was stopped, the patient did well, and the epidural was taken out that later that day. This is post-op day two. On <clears throat> post-op day three, the Ketorolac ran out, um, as it does after 72 hours, and re scheduled ibuprofen was started. <clears throat> Excuse me. The pain service had signed off um, on this patient after the epidural came out and the, the child was doing well. On post-op day four, um, the child started to become more agitated. And again, this child was nonverbal. So it's hard to kind of differentiate what's pain, what's not pain at this point, especially in a nonverbal child. And we rely heavily on the family. But the family wasn't present as much. And um, so we came back on service and um, took a look at this child. And there was really no change in medications. The only change that occurred, really, was the Ketorolac stopped and the child was now on scheduled ibuprofen. We didn't think much of it and continued to recommend physical therapy and psychology involved and child life with distraction techniques. And eventually the, the child started to get a little better and was eventually discharged on post-op day seven. But we thought this is kind of interesting. We didn't expect this turn of events. So we sent this test, and this is a, just a buccal swab. It's a very non-invasive test on these children. And this came back, and you can't really see it, but um, this particular report, which is a company called MedComp, gives medications by category. So this whole category is pain medications. Uh, this is gastrointestinal medications. These are uh, infections. I can't even read it up there. And so they have three different, well, four different columns. One's a drug class here. So you've got NSAIDs, opioids, muscle relaxants, 
and they actually have a row for fibromyalgia agents. I didn't know there was a specific fibromyalgia agent, but there is, apparently. Um, and then here they have standard precautions, so no change in what we would normally think about by giving these medications. The second column here is use with caution. So you might want to worry a little bit about these medications being given. And then over here, red, consider um, alternatives. So if you look in the use with caution under NSAIDs, there's ibuprofen here. In the standard precautions, there's Ketorolac here. So the only change really was ibuprofen in this patient. And um, so they actually give a gene-by-gene -gene report with the medications. And this is, again, two pages out of 50-something pages. So it gives a lot of these medications here. Here's ibuprofen, where it says that the patient has a possible sensitivity to ibuprofen because he's a, more, a poor metabolizer at the CYP2 uh, 2C9 gene. And what that means, and it goes on to explain a little explanation here, is that you need to be careful, especially in patients who might have gastrointestinal problems, such as uh, reflux disease. Might consider lower dose, even, if needed. Um, and then over here on this column, and this is, there's no rhyme or reason to these medications, but it gives medications by um, gene as well as to what, which ones actually work well, which ones they would recommend. So um, in retrospect, and I'm not saying that the change from Ketorolac to ibuprofen is probably what caused the increase in agitation. I'm just saying that, hey, this is some more information that maybe next time when this patient comes in for surgery, we can avoid ibuprofen, and maybe there might be a, a different outcome. The bigger picture is, how cool are these tests? And, and look at the information that they can provide. So let me give you one more example, and then we're almost done here. So this is a different patient. This is a different test done by a gene site. So, um, sorry, I've got ice in my mouth. I didn't mean to gulp that one. All right, my tongue is numb now. <laughs> Okay, so a uh, different patient. This patient is not actually a pain patient. This patient actually has depression and anxiety. The reason I came to meet this patient was because he had had a few minor surgeries in the past where he was treated with narcotics, um, specifically a few of these surgeries. He got oxycodone, he got um, hydrocodone, and he actually got hydromorphone intraoperatively and in the PACU. And he said to me, you know what, I never had any benefit. No pain relief from these medications. And these were weight-based doses, so appropriately dosed medications. I never got pain relief. I never even had euphoria from these medications. I had, it was like a drink of water without the ice. But basically, no, no uh, benefit whatsoever. And I think that's weird. And I said, well, I agree, that is kind of weird. So um, nothing really happened, but luckily his good psychiatrist, because he does have anxiety and depression, was not doing well. He had been on venlafaxine <clears throat> for a long time, hadn't done well, finally just said, you know what, I'm going to wean myself off of it. He took himself off the venlafaxine, wasn't doing well, put himself back on the venlafaxine, and was just not doing well at all. And um, so the psychiatrist said, you know what, this is kind of weird. Let's go ahead and order this test. So they did his buckle swab, sent the test off, and these results came back. And again, these are a few pages out of a lot of, a lot of pages. Um, but before we get to the, the um, depression and anxiety part of it, I just want to look at the pain control thing. So if you look at the second column here, and this is very similar format, okay, green, yellow, red. So uses directed with normal precautions. Uh, if you're going to use these, you want to take moderate precautions. And you probably don't want to use this column of medications here, okay? So here in the second column, moderate gene drug interaction, uh, here you see the hydrocodone, you see the oxycodone, you see the hydromorphone, you see fentanyl, uh, tramadol, codeine. Um, most of the opioids that we ever, ever use in patients with acute pain, right? And so if you look over here on the right, there's these numbers, and I apologize how small this is. Um, but if you look at the numbers and go down to a key, so these all mostly have number four, and I have to squint here, but it says uh, genotype may impact drug metabolism of action and um, result in reduced efficacy, which is what number four says down here. And all of these have number four. So it's no wonder that this patient didn't get any kind of benefit from these medications. And in fact, if he were to have a surgery in the future, 
there's not a good medication, not a good opioid for this patient to take. These other ones that use with as directed and standard precautions are all agonist, antagonist medications. They're probably not the best for um, acute pain control. So if he were to go to surgery in the future or have an injury where he would need opioids, I would probably recommend using higher doses or starting at higher doses of those medications and then monitoring closely. All right, now on to the antidepressant and anxiety. So venlafaxine is in this column, as you can see here. You look at the key, and the key says, serum levels may be too high. Be careful. All right, so as you know, if, if an SSRI or SNRI is producing, is, is too high in the blood, you can actually have the opposite effect of antidepressant or anxiolysis. And so that was probably what was happening with this patient. Um, these, this test, most tests actually also look at the MTHR gene as well, and he was um, heterozygous for a polymorphism of that gene that actually results in decreased folate um, production. So his folate levels were super, super low. Well, folate's important because it's involved in the production of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, three very important chemicals in our body that help us with depression and anxiety. So his astute psychiatrist put him on folate supplementation, lowered his dose of, of, of uh, venlafaxine, and he's doing great. I saw him last week. Feels great. Um, so useful tests, I think, in a lot of patients. Where do I see this going, or what's the benefit, I think, in the future? For acute pain patients, I, I would totally love to see, and I think we'll see it in the not too far distant future, but patients coming to a pain clinic, for example, when they have their surgery date scheduled, getting a test like this and sitting down with the, with the pain physician and actually planning out a very detailed, personalized pain management plan for that patient, wherein we minimize the amount of opioids they require, we minimize side effects of, of unnecessary medications because we know how they're genes will react to certain medications, and we increase their um, pain control, their satisfaction, and hopefully prevent the progression of chronic pain in these patients. From a chronic pain standpoint, um, gene-guided therapy is very, very important and I think is very beneficial, and we can hopefully um, minimize and avoid unnecessary medications in these patients. The antidepressant medications, anxiety medications are used, as you know, very commonly in patients with chronic pain. So these tests can also shed a, a lot of light on those patients. Um, and then finally questions, and this is, this is um, funny. <laughs> this prescription won't make you feel better, but it will stop your whining and make everyone else feel better. It's funny, but there's also some sad truth to that. And um, I think over the years, we, we might give in to the whining and the annoyance of some of our patients and probably prescribe medications that they probably don't need. So thank you very much, and I'll entertain any questions that might well. So it is covered by um, insurance. Access covers um, most of those tests. The cost is anywhere between $200 um, out of pocket and $3,000, depending on which company you go with. Yeah, you see, them, you see them a lot of places. You, you want to look at what results they provide, though. Yeah, so the question is, how does culture play into basically pain response in patients? Um, so again, it's the, the quote, pain is not just a reflection of tissues, but it's an output of the brain. And so it's, we've all known, mostly in high school, that one individual, and it's usually some, some guy, 
who likes to go around and my example is this guy in high school had a staple and he loved to staple himself. He'd just go around stapling himself, you know, all the place. Things that would make other people cry. He thought it was the coolest thing, but it never hurt him, or at least it seemed to never hurt him. So why in him does it not hurt? And in me, I would probably crawl into the fetal position and cry. What's the difference? And, and a lot of it is our environment, the context in which it's happening. I know in a lot of the mission trips with third world countries, you know, even the cleft lips and palates, we, we give them Tylenol. Here we give them fentanyl and they go to the ICU overnight. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a totally different um, experience. And I think it's really what is the context of the pain. And, you know, we in America, because we have resources, I think, and, I, and I'm speculating because I don't know that there have been good studies done but, um, you know, where we have resources, we like to treat kids and we don't like to see anyone grimace at all. And, you know, we do general anesthesia for IVs and because we can, right? Um, not because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, Craig. A lie? No, so, so that's, that's the idea behind transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, TENS units used by um, physical therapists. So it's desensitization. It, it is not a lie. Um, it's, it's useful in a lot of patients. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.